Hi, I'm Tom Holloway. I'm the assistant director of the Global School of Supernatural Ministry, the dream of Randy Clark for a ministry school that would train up, equip, and launch supernatural disciples of Jesus Christ into the world. And I'm really grateful to be invited to share with you today uh, from a message that we do in the school, in which we do a whole day, a message we call The Church and the Churches. I'd just like to share some key ideas from that uh, day that we do together today with you. Now, if you've been listening to Dr. Randy Clark or involved with the Ministry of Global Awakening for any period of time, I think that one thing that people discover and I often have people come and express gratitude about is that part of the goal of and the mission of Global Awakening is to be a bridge builder, is to help believers understand each other and to do things together that consolidate our relationships and open us up to the fullness of what Jesus has given to the church so that we all could walk in it and bear a unified witness to the world. So one thing I think that's a serious realization that's worth considering maybe at the outset here is that you and I are born into a certain place in time, in salvation history, in the world, and we can kind of presume the things that we're born into as part of our worldview. And one thing that we may not have realized is that you and I have never had a unified church as part of the unconscious background of the way that we see the world. You know, for a thousand years from as far west as England or as far east as the reaches of Asia, there was one church largely sharing one worldview, bringing a kind of unified picture basically of the gospel to people who had not yet heard it. Now, I think it's important to realize that unity in the church doesn't mean uniformity. You know, equality doesn't necessarily mean equivalency. And unity also doesn't mean pretending that we're all identical. Sometimes at a conference, a, a speaker or a prophet will you know, say something in a moment of inspiration about that you know, a time is coming in the kingdom when there won't be denominations and there won't be individual churches and we won't think of ourselves this way. And people stand up and they cheer because it, it really heartens us to think about that reality. But it also involves something that it calls some, for something from us. It would call for a response. It, it looks like something to get there. And some of that is a little bit of work and letting the Holy Spirit work on us. So I'd like to share three key ideas maybe today with you. And one of them is that sufficient unity in the body of Christ is part of the conditions that Jesus expressed for this revival that we long for and, and pray for and speak about so much and conditional for the world finally recognizing who he is. The second thing is that I think there are two great unconscious obstacles to getting that desire of Jesus to come into the world. And to one is for us to recognize that human beings have a deep-seated need to be right. And the second one is the recognition that oftentimes in the church we can knowingly or unknowingly see through a filter of people in a spiritual caste system where they kind of rank and how much they understand about God and the kingdom of God. And the third point is that when we finally come to a point by the Holy Spirit's leading that we can stop separating ourselves from the parts of the church that don't look or think just like us, that don't worship or pray just like us, that we can maybe move an obstacle out of our own way to receive a godly and spiritual inheritance from those who have gone before us that we can both live in and minister from, but I think also that we have the ability to impart and to share and to strengthen other people with so uh, that we could share in all the good things that God has done in the many centuries with his friends who have known him and loved him in every time and place. You know, the church that unfortunately for them had the hallmark of disunity uh, and got a lot of teaching and Holy Spirit-led correction from St. Paul as that uh, first century church in Corinth. They kind of took it on the nose for the rest of us for <laughs> salvation history and we hopefully we're the better for the truth that the Holy Spirit reveals coming out of that. But you know, right at the outset of Paul addressing them in the way that comes to us in 1 Corinthians, he says to them, uh, in a it's a rhetorical statement, is Christ divided? And in true Paul you know, fashion, his obvious answer is no. So you and I can say that because Christ is not divided, I am not divided. The Father lives in me, the Son lives in me, and Paul goes on to say in the same place, 
we have the mind of Christ. So if I have Christ and I have the mind of Christ, it means that I'm not divided and you're not divided. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we welcome you and ask you to illuminate the word of God and the words of God and that you would fulfill Jesus's promise that you will bring us into all the truth. I ask you that even as we love the truth, that you would separate one thing from another and that you would compound your truth in our hearts, that the same love that Jesus has for his bride, the same love that the father has for a daughter he's making perfect, this assembly that he called forth, that you would move in us to have love for each other, that we would be able to worship in one spirit, and that we would come to know a fullness of truth by loving each other as Jesus loved us. We ask you this in this holy name above all names, Jesus our Lord, amen. So it should seem fairly obvious to us that the things that Jesus uh, is recorded to have said on the last night of his life, the last things he wanted to say to those who were closest to him might be some of the things that were the most important to him in his great hour of duress or as he was about to accomplish his passion and his death and his resurrection. In John 17, uh, beginning in verse 20, I'm gonna just take some verses and I'm gonna, in the first case, use it from the Message Bible because I want us to amplify just the thoughts that are in Jesus' heart and get at some very important basic realities. He says in the presence of his disciples, which John records this, he says, I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me because of them and their witness about me. And listen to this, the goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they might be one heart and one mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them so they will be, uh, be unified and together as we are, I in them and you in me, then they'll be mature in the oneness and give the godless world evidence that you sent me and you love them in the same way you loved me. So if you're asking Jesus in this, in this important hour in which he's in great duress and passion as he enters into his suffering, what is the goal? Jesus says the goal is that for all those who believe in me would become one heart and one mind. He says that the conditions, when will the world believe? When they become one heart and one mind. And he says, that's when they'll grow into maturity. Now, I think that, you know, if you are regularly in the word of God, when you hear maturity in the New Testament, it's almost hard not to think of what Paul has to say in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, uh, beginning at verse 11, when he says this, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. He didn't say, the same grace was given to each one of us. He's saying the, the empowerment that was given to us was according to what Jesus saw was best for our place for each one of us. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave this thing that, that we value so highly. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for what? For the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Till we understand what Jesus has revealed similarly, that we have an experience of him that mirrors each other in some ways, that we grow up to, be, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So if you're gonna summarize that, that kind of dense and important statement of Paul to the body, the first part says that unity from the Holy Spirit is the condition of this. And the second part says the fivefold simply equips the empowerment that you each have so that we can become the mature Jesus in every way. So that when the world sees a church, what they see is a grown-up Jesus. They see the, the, they see the full expression of Jesus, not just simply Jesus's hand or Jesus's smile or Jesus's compassion, but they get to see all of Christ, and that is what will fulfill His desire as He enters into His passion. You know, if you stick around in 
third wave charismatic Christianity or whatever the latest label is, or sometimes we say, well, whatever this is, which is just a grateful uh, being present to what it is that God has done in our time, you can know there's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of words that have acquired usage, and sometimes we just get used to applying those words or saying those words in the appropriate moment. And sometimes those words bear a deeper uh, examination. What does that really mean? I think two of those important ideas when we're speaking about the church and the churches and a unity that bears witness is the notion of agreement and the notion of alignment. I think that you, as well as I, believe that when God sends his word into the earth, it accomplishes the thing for which he sends it. It is living and effective, and he does what it, he says it will do, whether that is his lasting public revelation to us, or that's in a moment when God generously gives us a rhema living word you know, to, to people for something that he's doing right here, right now. But I think that you also agree, if we look at the Old Testament, God's willingness and sending his word to accomplish a thing had to land on a willing generation, for example, in Israel. It had to be a time when his people on the earth were in agreement with the thing that he was saying for it to accomplish what he always meant to bless them with. When it came to a kingship, a king that they asked for, you know, God was willing and said that he would, you know, he would show what a kingship could look like. But in the case of Saul, it had to wait until a willing David who was in agreement with the heart and the word of God, it could, it could land on him. Jesus says in Matthew 18, and this is in verse 19, most notably to us, again, I say to you, meaning, listen, I'm gonna tell you something serious. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In a sense, we could just say that agreement means our blessing, what it is that God says that he is doing. This is kind of a hallmark of uh, the, the vineyard movement and the teaching of John Wimber, of which in a sense we're kind of spiritual inheritors. It's getting into the flow of the divine will. So, so anytime that you and I say amen, you know, biblically in the language sense, what we're saying is let it be established. It's like pulling the trigger on, on the word or on the promise. Let it, let it be accomplished according to what has already been said. Let, let this thing come into being. And when God has said a thing and we, with our hearts, with our spirits, say, amen, let it be established. When we here in the first heaven agree with God in the third heaven, everything in between has to either get in line or has to get out of the way. And it happens. Now, I could, I could ask you this. We believe that God shares measures. Uh, he's the only healer, but he shares measures of his healing with us. You know, Jesus is the prophet who is to come into the world, but by now we believe that he shares a measure of prophecy with us. Do you believe that God shares a measure of his authority with us? He, he is the head. This is what authority refers to. But there is an authority that comes in godly agreement with the Father's purpose. It means he who is the head shares a measure of his headship over the present situation that we're praying and agreeing with each other and agreeing with God's word about. Going back to that church that was working out the kind of bumps and pitfalls of unity in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 also, and Paul begins to address the situation. He says really like from his heart to those whom he loves in that church, I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment, that you are thinking the things that God has said and you are evaluating and, and making a judgment about them the way that God has said. Have you ever heard that in the great wave and move of uh, the Argentinian evangelists and the, and the South American evangelists of the second part of the 20th century, that they discovered over the period of time of mounting crusades, going into cities, partnering with churches. After a certain period of time, the Holy Spirit showed them something. They began to discover that when the pastors of a city and in turn the churches of a city were in a percentage of agreement, that is what made the difference whether mounting a crusade led by the Holy Spirit bore lasting fruit in that city. And they said, we saw 30% agreement between the pastors of that region and 30% agreement between those churches. We could go and hit the streets, work miracles, rent the stadium, preach the message. 
and we'd get a 30% response from the region or the city. There'd be a 30%, you know, uh, a salvation rate and people that after a period of time were still walking in the things of God. But they said, we saw a city where there was 80% agreement and there had been forged and fought for relationships between the pastors with each other and their churches with each other for the sake of Jesus in the city. We would go in and the spirit of God would come and there'd be an 80% response from that city. There'd be 80% of those people got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. You could come back after some time and 80% of that city was still walking in the grace that they had been given. Revival is not just a thing to put on coffee cups and t-shirts. It's more, it can become more third wave jargon, but the revival that we long to see, and in fact, we know that God wants to give, I think can be held up in its fullness until there is that sufficient unity in the body. Doing everything else right, thinking all the right thoughts, having friends around us, having great worship, giving great teaching, doing great outreach, but if it's not the body of Christ doing that, it's only limited in the scale of the thing that God wants to accomplish through it. So there's agreement on the one hand, and there's alignment, this other thing that we say, usually in the same breath, agreement and alignment. Let's just say that alignment means our amen to the decreed place in God's set purpose and will that we find ourselves. How do we relate to each other in the grace that's been given to us individually. Seems like the apostles initially really struggled with this. They were back on the road, you know, straggling along in a line and he overhears them arguing about which of us is the greatest, who did the best thing in the last town, who who does Jesus sit the closest to, or, uh, you know, uh, the the sons of Zebedee coming, getting their mom of all people to go ask Jesus, could you grant me this thing, that when you sit in, on your throne in your kingdom, that my sons would sit at your right and on your left, jockeying for position, you know, trying to find, let me get a greater place uh, in the kingdom. Let me get a greater place in the sight of God. Back to 1 Corinthians. In chapter 12, verse 18, Paul says, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If you could say that heaven and earth, uh, even in, in the, uh, the, the metaphor that Jesus gives us of the spiritual reality of being the extension of him, his body, his, his present incarnation on the earth. It, what if heaven and earth work analogously to a nervous system in a human body? It means it takes alignment of the key parts for a command which has been given by the willing head that says, I want it, I'm going to do it, for it to reach its expression in the body. If there's a rupture in the nervous system or there's a misalignment of the spine or the nerves, like the head can be saying all at once, all day, but if that connection for each proper place being joined properly together isn't there, then the thing that the head has been willing to do is not being expressed through the body. You know, I was a pastor for 14 years uh, out in the prairie in the Midwest and had three churches at one time in, in uh, small towns, farming towns, and uh, that's where I discovered that cessationism was a thing for some people. I prayed one day at a pastor's lunch and somebody corrected my prayer. I didn't know that people didn't think that God was still doing the things that he's always been doing. But those of us who did, kind of a, a motley crew of friends of Jesus who are pastors, would get together uh, at, at my home and uh, just pray together. And I really just enjoyed their friendship. And there was uh, this is not an application to a denomination in general. It was a specific situation in a specific town. The assembly of God in that town was in practical fact cessationist and didn't practice the gifts. Their pastor was actually a Baptist that they had wanted to be their pastor and he was a spirit-filled believer. So this is the body of Christ. And one day it was just he and I and we were praying at the table and he, we began to just bless each other and bless each other's congregation. So, so very different. And as he prayed for me, he said, I remember he said the words, God, I accept Tom as a full brother in the Lord and I bless him and I bless his church. And as he prayed, I began to have a vision in a time when vision was not common in my life. I just didn't quite know what was happening. And of all things, what I saw was a covalent bond, which is when two elements, two atoms, begin to share electrons as they move toward each other so that the charge that's on one is actually constituting the bond that exists between them in their orbit. In a sense to say, what I am charged with, you also share, and what you are charged with, I also share. What's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine 
because we have come into an agreement with the power that charges us to begin with. Now I say often to the students in the School of Supernatural Ministry, when we're just gonna like explore an idea is like turn to your neighbor, and if you have a neighbor, you turn and say, don't make a doctrine out of this, okay? Let's just like consider an idea in the scriptures without making a doctrine out of it at first. I, I have the belief that when we agree together with what God is saying and God is doing, and we come into alignment with that purpose in our roles and with each other in our hearts, as Paul says, in our minds, in our judgment, because of the one spirit that we share, we begin to share in each other's anointing in an in, in an increasing in an exponential way to fulfill the purpose that God has for us working together, even as we remain what Paul also calls each given the manifestation for the spirit of the common good. We each have a gift that's ours, given, but it's for the common good. And as we come into that godly agreement in Jesus' name, I believe that the anointing we have begins to increase and the gifts that are on me and the gifts that are on my spiritual family are available to you. And, and, and vice versa, back the other way. What's mine becomes yours, and what's yours becomes mine. So as people who wanna see the will of Jesus come about, I think we move on to a kind of important question. How? We are how kind of people, we wanna do stuff. How do we get to that agreement and that unity that leads to Jesus being able to do the things he's so willing to do? Now depending on how long you've been a Christian and how your relationships and your church background work, our way sometimes is we just want to like go for the spiritual jugular. We want to get down to hammering out the brass tacks of truth. We want to talk about doctrine and see where we are with other people. You know, one day back in that same church environment, I went and I was preparing to go to the nursing home to celebrate communion with the people who were there. It was a simple weekday afternoon. And as I went to, to prepare those elements, I heard the Lord say to me in a way that startled me, until you love my church as much as I do, you can't speak into her. Now the church and the churches and the unity of the churches and God's plan for the churches has always been very important to my heart. And Jesus on a Tuesday afternoon saying out of the blue to me as a point of conscience, until you love my church as much as I do, you can't speak into her. I think it's because if we don't love the church like Jesus loves her, we're not trustworthy with what we think about her or handling relationships within her. Consider this. Instead of just diving into the truth with people thinking that we're gonna like reason other people into our camp or they think they're gonna reason us into theirs, what if we had these three dialogues, so to speak, the way we did life? We could begin with the dialogue of charity, which means we can do love together to do in common the things that Jesus told us to do. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was alone, when I was brokenhearted, when I was imprisoned, when I was sick, and you came to me, you, you did that to me. This is like the dialogue of love that we can do together that's gonna bring us into the flow of love or the things that, that God is doing among us. The second is something that I think that we do engage in, which is the dialogue of prayer, that we know what we hold in common about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that we have a love of the Spirit and the, that He's given to us. We love to worship together. We love to sing together. We love to pray together because we know that we're already in agreement. And I think that that agreement, that sharing of the Holy Spirit bond, begins to draw us both in the bonds of love and in the bonds of agreement so that then when we have relational credibility with each other, when, when I know that my heart is trustworthy because you and I genuinely love each other, and you know that I will not just wait for you to stop talking so I can make a point, but that I'm really listening to your heart and have the vulnerability to consider it in light of what God has shown you that I could begin to, to entertain the truth. It's because neither of us is trying to win an argument or to come out on top so that I can hold on to my worldview, but that we really care about each other and we want to know the fullness of the truth. And we don't, we're not afraid that the other person's gonna use the truth as a hammer to try to put me but put an oval into a round into a round hole. This brings me to kind of the second idea, which is these kind of two unconscious obstacles that I think that we can do something about that, that make it so hard for us to experience a real unity rather than a sentimental one. 
And the first one is this deep need that we have to be right. You know, our minds, as made by God, have a godly orientation towards the truth. An open mind is like an open mouth. When you put something substantial in there, you bite down on that thing and it's supposed to, to nourish you. Does it ever occur to you that the way that we even express the truths of the gospel or the scriptures to ourselves today is, even at a very subtle level, formed intrinsically by past disputes between believers? It means that when I meet somebody new or you do and we're discipling them or sharing with them, I'm framing the truths of faith sometimes as way, the way that they came out of like a kind of church fist fight at some century or some recent time in the past. This is what we insisted on in response to other Christians. This is how now we say these things and they're in conscious, uh, consciously or unconsciously, they're rejecting something else that sometimes other believers have come to. At a fracture, uh, each fracture in history of the oneness that Jesus prayed for, desired, and began us with, one of the common elements was the need to be right in our understanding of God and to, to clamp down on that and to go forward with a kind of certainty within ourselves. But let's say this, it's not just that, like some brokenness of the human heart and mind or some taint of sin, you know, still poisoning that. It was also people acting in good faith according to how they were understanding God. It was people who had deep convictions about the way that they were encountering the word of God. It was belief in what might have been a revelatory insight that needed to be highlighted during their place and their time in salvation history or something that had been neglected that God highlighted as a value to somebody that they, as a movement, championed in their place and in their time that the whole counsel of God could be appreciated. It was a desire on the part of individuals and of, of, of groups of people to be faithful to what they earnestly believed in good conscience God was saying or God was doing doing in their midst. It was the Holy Spirit who could have instigated even that kind of like sandpaper between believers because of something that maybe some of us, us being the body of Christ, put in a junk drawer for a period of time or put out in the garage that he said, no, this is part of the whole of what Jesus died and rose again for, for all people to inherit. It's hard to overestimate our own kind of like wanting to have a handle on reality and for the ways that we think about it in our worldview to kind of to kind of prevail so that we don't have to constantly adjust. Um, but when that godly orientation of the mind towards truth has in it an old insecurity that's born of original brokenness or it's touched by pride, then it just says, I, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to change. I don't want to rethink what I've already made sense of. You know, to be honest, it's not, it's not only like some prevalence of, you know, some, some echo of sin nature or just like a stubbornness in the human heart. Part of the real reason that we can clamp down on this is because of how good Jesus is. However you came to know him, you know, however you came to know him, God has wanted to get all he can, anywhere he can. I think we see this especially today when God goes outside the walls of the church. God goes outside the boundaries sometimes of what we're comfortable with. God is moving amongst people groups that the rest of us have not made a move towards in his name. God is moving towards the least or the seemingly the least likely, which incidentally is oftentimes a signature that that's probably God, right? I think we recognize that. He wants to meet people however they can receive him. And sometimes that's a scandal to us because we want him to meet them the way that we met him or the way that we he's we were teaching people that he he universally wants to meet people. However, a person experiences that relentless transformative love of God, it changes them and there is nothing there's nothing like it. When you met Jesus and the Holy Spirit came into your life, everything else pales by comparison. Now, while that's true of the overwhelming love of God for us, it doesn't mean that every encounter that a person has where they meet the real God and he changes their life is a complete revelation of everything there is to know about God. Like we are told we see him as through like some kind of wavy mirror. But when we see him, we will encounter a full revelation of who he is, even as he gives us a full revelation of who we are to him. But however you come to know God, it makes sense of your life. It shows you your significance. It gives you the meaning of your life. And 
think about it. Whether that's a 12-year-old girl who got shipped off the Bible camp by a you know, well-meaning family, but one night at the campfire, the gospel landed on her, and in her 12-year-old way, she came to make Jesus the Lord of her life and grew into that in her life. Or some merchant marine keeping the night watch you know, out at sea for weeks at a time, just as like reading some Gideon New Testament, and the gospel lands on them as they, they search and talk out to God. Some middle-aged lady who's been doing her best, and she's just like living by religious paradigms within denominational or non-denominational church. And then the Spirit of God comes to her, and she experiences the love of God, and everything is like new from that point on. The, the monk who entered as a young man in some mountain monastery far in the reaches of Europe who has been living and seeking and emptying and just being available to the moving presence of God and whatever the mysteries and secrets are that God reveals to a soul abandoned to them like that. Each one of those people, as far flung as they are in human experience, could say, I know how God does things because he did this to me. I know how God does things because this is what he has done for me. Do you see how sometimes the very goodness of Jesus is the thing that can make us clamp down? Because I don't wanna think that my experience is somehow not, not correct. It's not true, or there's something about that. I've sort of observed that it seems like denominations or historical movements in the church, and, and even individuals, can have what uh, I've kind of come to call highest values this aspect of God's nature that he's lavished on them, or a truth that was neglected that when they took it up became a, a bright burning torch. And th this can become like a guiding light for a person, for a local church, for a movement, for a denomination, because this is the thing that God was doing in that instance, in that person, in that place, in that time. It's just that sometimes it can be seen like it is the only thing, right? I I'm truly grateful for the things that God did in John Wimber. I'm really grateful for the things God did in Randy Clark. You know, Global Awakening isn't just about healing. It's about the gospel and the fullness of the Holy Spirit for all people. Uh, but there's been an anointing on one man's life for healing and the ability to give it away so that that's what you walk in, that's what I walk in. There's an emphasis and a high value for that, a high value for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and impartation. Uh, there can be a high value for the word of knowledge. And it could seem to the outside person or another believer like you, you all are just about experiencing the Holy Spirit. You know, you've heard these conversations and you've had these conversations. And sometimes it's not until we see ourselves from the, the experience or the perception of other people who have other high values about parts of God that we might, we might see that um, there's a whole picture and maybe there is there's a lot more to the picture, the way that God sees it, that even I myself have yet to grow into which can only be a blessing to me. When somebody else then comes along with another truth or another high value or a truth claim that's different than ours, it can feel like there's maybe an implicit threat in that. Well, then I might have to rethink everything or I might, are you trying to tell me I've been off track all along or I don't really know God in some way? And I don't think that's really what the case is, but it, it can feel like that when somebody else's worldview or experience of God is significantly different from our own. The worst you see in believers is when in order for a, a person or a group to feel like they really do have the truth and to not have to change, it's important to make sure that somebody else is proven wrong. The, ug the uglier parts of the internet, like an unsearched church things on the internet, because some people live simply to, to defeat the beliefs of other people or to prove them wrong or to compound an in-group. And I don't think this is what Jesus was looking for on that last night of his life as they walked by lantern light across the Kidron Valley to what they didn't know, but he did know, was waiting. It's interesting, and it's like a little footnote, I, I observed that the things that Christians will really black each other's eyes over seem to be the beginning and the end. What I mean is your beliefs about creation or your beliefs about the end times and the last things. Uh, and it's interesting that in 325 in Nicaea, when the believers of the world, their leaders and overseers prayed for the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead them into all the truth, and they shared the apostolic faith they had received, what they'd been preached, what their churches were based on, and they formed that creed that they wanted to say, this is the gospel as we've received it. Two things didn't make the cut, the beginning, creation, and the end, other than he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Just 
a historical observation about what was on the mind of the apostolic era of the church versus the things of what's on the mind of the internet era of the church. It's not that those things or any of these beliefs that we hold dear, our high values aren't important and that we don't want to be in a fullness of the truth. The difference is uh, when I think that somebody else's truth is a threat to my ability to feel secure about who Jesus is to me and, and I'd rather break relationship than go deeper in love with them, deeper in prayer with them so that we could look and say, what has the Holy Spirit said to you? And here's what the Holy Spirit has said to me. God, would you lead us into the fullness of the truth? Sometimes, you know, we could justify our offense, that the fact that we are loving the truth. But I think it's important to remember what John said. What is it that casts out fear? He said, well, it's when your love comes to perfection and when you've been perfectly loved by God. And if we stop being afraid that me entertaining somebody else's idea as we seek the truth together means that I'm being unfaithful to God or I'm compromising the truth or I'm, you know, I'm throwing out the word of God or I'm losing my certainty. Uh, when I'm not afraid of that and I don't feel like I have something to lose, then I don't have to defend being right. I can really enter into with another person. What has the Holy Spirit said to you? And here's what I feel like the Holy Spirit has said to me. One thing I'm really heartened by, and I'm going to take a slight risk in the way I say this here, is that it seems like in the Word of God that my salvation in new life isn't primarily based on how completely accurate all of my information is. Our faith rests on God, on His character, on His faithfulness, on His believability, and and on His love for us, the thing that is not going to change that he's not gonna change his mind about us. We can trust his revelation, but uh, it's subject to our limitations, right? Uh, a knowledge of the truth will set you free, or God desires all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. But apparently, completely or thoroughly accurate information doesn't seem like it's always God's highest value, especially at the beginning when he's giving revelation to people. I think about um, the apostles all coming back, all riled up, thinking Jesus is going to pat them on the back when we said, we saw some guy casting out demons in your name, and he doesn't follow us, and he's not at like all the meetings, so we made him stop and left those people demonized, to which it doesn't say so in the Greek, but Jesus uh, facepalmed himself and, and made a statement like, please do not stop people who are delivering people in my name, because if they're not for, against us right now, in fact, they're for us. Or... You think about this Ethiopian eunuch riding along his car and the Spirit of God moves Philip to catch up with him and he says, hey, do you know what you're reading there? Because everybody just drives along with the windows down reading the prophet Isaiah, a souvenir from Jerusalem on the way back to Africa. And it's the matter of one car ride with only one Old Testament book of the Bible that Philip preaches Jesus to him. And the guy says, stop the car, <laughs> like there's a ditch. Well, I wanna, I wanna receive this Jesus right now. And then Philip goes on his way, and this guy heads back to Ethiopia, uh, which was ripe for John Mark to bring the gospel there, it, ripe for the foundations of the Coptic stream of Christianity, perhaps because of this one encounter with one Old Testament passage and somebody sharing one time knowing Jesus. Apparently, completely accurate information isn't always God's highest value. The second obstacle can be our own kind of faulty habit of seeing others in a kind of spiritual caste system. Who's closer and who knows more and who's got more of the fullness? Because that's what that's what God is all about. God showed me that I needed to repent of this. Um, when some years ago, my now wife and, uh, and our children, we were attending in another state, um, a, a church that I called the movie theater church. It was a startup, non-denominational church that met on Sunday mornings in this local movie theater. People were in Hawaiian shirts, eating cinnamon rolls, you know, it was the best of like seeker church. Uh, what I noticed was that their worship and the commentator of the worship leaders, it always seemed like kind of like so tight and a little bit guilty. And I have to admit, I was in a little somewhat obnoxious part of spirit-filled life, as maybe you can understand yourself. And that worship leader, I remember said one day, she said, you know, God, we know we're not worthy of your love. And I was just had enough. And I was like, I am, uh, which I had many elbows over time given to me by my wife. But my point was what I observed in that church was like it's expository preaching from Romans. It's just unpacking. It's just the gospel of salvation every week because that was the 
tradition and the highest values that the leaders and the founders of that church came from. And they would say, you know, we're not church as usual. How many churches say, we're not church as usual? I ask, well, how long before not church as usual becomes actually church as usual? But it was still like dissatisfied with what they would deem formal, unsatisfying Christianity, but they didn't go into the more. Then I knew people were being prayed for there and being healed, but they never shared those testimonies in the weekly service and they didn't direct people to that ministry. And it was just the Bible and there was no illustrations because there were no testimonies from the week. And their highest value was studying the Bible and getting people saved. And here I was knowing what I, I think I know, but I realized like, am I just on the next floor of where somebody else is and looking down and saying, that's, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. And I felt really suddenly confronted by the voice of Jesus in my heart during one of those services when he said, you know, I said, they, they kind of, they need what we have. Like in a sense saying in your heart, I've got the truth. And Jesus saying to me, they do have the truth. There's enough truth here for people to be saved and for people to live lives that please God. Do you think they're less saved than you are? Do you think that I love them less than I love you? If they never know what you think you know, Tom, I am not disappointed in them. Anytime I'm on a spiritual journey and God brings me up a little higher, and I look down at people who are where I was just a short time ago, am I not saying that that didn't matter in my life when I was there? And if I go up a little bit farther by the grace of God and I see more, I experience more, I'm open to more, I understand more, does that mean that where I am right now doesn't matter and all of this is worthless? I think instead of uh, the ability to think that we can somehow look down, there's not a looking down. There's just our own hearts looking at Jesus saying, I do want the more and I do want to go higher rather than looking back and judging where we were or judging where we estimate other people to be. In every sense, the church has got to quit in one way or another cursing the church, you know, running down the church, judging the church in the first place because she's Jesus's wife. In the second place, at least according to the apostolic faith, she's our mom. By, by being that bride. But the, the point for us here in seeking revival is we are never going to, according to the words of Jesus, come to mature manhood, the full measure of Jesus, if we're always gonna be focused on criticizing and running down the church that's not like us. And I think that means for us personally, we've got to forgive once and for all whatever our disappointments are with maybe church that we first encountered or that we were raised in, people who couldn't give us something that by maybe no fault of their own, they didn't have to give, rather than looking at by the grace of God. We do have whatever we have, wherever we are on those steps and on that staircase, and we've been entrusted with it for the moment. We've got to release and stop judging churches that we did belong to and offended or disappointed us, or even churches that we've never belonged to or denominations, but we've decided we have an opinion and we have a judgment about. I think that in some ways, it's been the devil's uh, ruse to keep us from coming into the fullness of something that he is afraid of, a church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And, uh, and it, it's not recognizing that every believer seems to be jealous for the honor of God, that somehow other people believing something different is gonna take away from who God is, and I've gotta defend God's reputation and the full counsel of God as I understand it. What if there are enormous portions of the kingdom of God that even people who have as much joy, have had as seen as much grace and power and transformation, effectiveness, the momentum and the wind of God in our sails, what if there are whole sections of the kingdom of God that we haven't understood are available to us yet? That we haven't understood, but yet other believers may have stewarded and treasured for centuries or even millennia because of knowing that Jesus is so good and that having the portion of the gospel that I have makes me feel like I've got everything that I just kind of clamp down on that. It, it seems unthinkable to us that there could be significant portions of things that God has for us, for all of those who belong to him, that I haven't encountered or I haven't understood. And instead, it's that's the problem that other Christians have. They need to come to us so that they can get what it is that we have. We're probably always 
going to filter what we discover in each other or each other's experiences of God through the primary language that Jesus called us through, the way that we have come to know him and value him and what our highest values are. But risk takers, and risk is a huge gold highlighted word, yeah, I think in this move of God and in this movement, risk takers are gonna have to learn the language and the customs of other people who have inherited riches from God if they're going to be able to bring what they do have to give to share with other people and other believers be able to receive it and in turn to be able to receive what other believers have treasured and stewarded and maybe carrying in more charismatic jargon that we ourselves would want to receive. We might want to say, no, I'm good, I'm content, I'm satisfied with what I've got. I like Because we like being with people who are like us. We don't like to swim upstream all the time. It feels good to be in the flow and in agreement with, with a body of people who are on the same page with us. But I think there's a caution to us not to mistake laziness or just flat out isolationism, just staying with our wagons circled, somehow I'm calling that contentment or that's just humility or I'm just living a simple life. God needs those risk takers because Jesus is the only real builder of unity, but he is doing it through us. And we can't be just one more generation who puts that off for heaven or puts that off for somebody else to be the one to have to do the messy work of loving other people well and sorting out the truth of God that's been given to us. We want to see the ancient churches activated again with word and power and joy so that the young churches can recognize brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in them. But we want the young churches to be activated again in that age-old authority and in the gift of mystery and contemplation and the oneness that those churches have been able to experience over the course of the centuries. And because each one carries anointing that the other one needs, and none of them fully recognize that about each other. Why not you? Why not me? And why not us now, simply in the relationships that God gives us to seek that oneness of mind and that oneness of judgment and to seek God's desire for his, his church to come to represent fully that mature Jesus on the earth so that an unbelieving world could come to believe. I'd like to pray with you, and um, I know we're not sitting in the same room together necessarily, but I'd like to just ask you if you would pray after me. And in, in the first place, I want you to be conscious of this. Holy Spirit, I ask you to reveal each person, to each person right now, what has been my godly inheritance for however long I've known Jesus and been part of his body? What have been the highest values that someone else transmitted to me? What have been the aspects of God and the goodness of God that someone else has highlighted and became part and parcel of how I know you and love you, God? What's the inheritance of the movements that led to me being able to know you like this, that come down like a spiritual patrimony, that you want to put into my hands because of people who loved you and in some cases fought for you or suffered for you, even died for you, that they so highly valued with their lives. Pray with me, and if you're able where you are, just, just, say, just say this out loud, okay? In the name of Jesus, I choose to forgive as I have been forgiven. I now choose to forgive, and I want you to insert there any church, any pastors, any tradition, or any individuals that have in any way been part of, of being disappointed or offended with the experience of the church. I forgive them. I renounce any right that I have held on to, to resentment or judgment. I release them from my hands, Lord, and I place them into your hands, our just judge. I break any curse I may have spoken or sent to them. I call down your blessings upon them. 
I repent, Jesus, of seeing other believers as enemies. And even as I hold fast to Jesus, the truth, I ask you to open my eyes to see and love in your people what you see and love in them. I call to myself now my righteous inheritance and the blessings of those moves of God that came in the generations before me. Now wait. God, I ask you to release anything that has been held up in spiritual inheritance from the body to anyone right now who's been free of these things. In Jesus' name, let it fall on them now, right where they are. Come, Holy Spirit. Let them come into the fullness of what you've deposited with your bride and your body. Come, Holy Spirit. And lastly, I just ask you to pray this with me as we conclude. Jesus, heal your church. Open our eyes. Empower our hearts to love your assembly the way you love her. Father, I thank you that there is one body and one spirit in Christ. Father, I release now in Jesus' name to all who believe in you, the good you have worked in me, the grace you have given me, the truth you have lifted high to me, that we may love all of you, every true aspect of yourself, which you have revealed to those who love you. Father, make us one that the world may believe that you sent Jesus for them and that you will love them the way you love us, the way you love Jesus. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform.